Well, Juan, thank you very much. Uh, very grateful to the Vincent Center and to the IEA for hosting us. Let me begin in deference to Terence's distinguished, uh, enormously distinguished medical background by inviting you to join me in a little thought experiment. Suppose that somebody invented a pill that would allow you to live in perfect health until the age of 120 and then die peacefully and painlessly. Such a pill, I put it to you, would put a lot of people out of work. It would be bad news for doctors and nurses. It would be catastrophic for the care home industry. It would be extremely bad news for the medical insurance industry. But would anyone regard those as valid arguments not to allow the pill to circulate? Now, ladies and gentlemen, here's the kicker. Would it make any difference whether that pill had been invented in your own country or somebody else's? All of the arguments for protectionism and mercantilism boil down to ways of prohibiting the free circulation of that pill. Right? Maybe not exactly that pill, but some other product that we find beneficial or that boosts our pleasure or utility. Anything that gives us a more pleasant life that we want to get you need to have a pretty good reason to come between the seller and the buyer. And the fact that the seller and the buyer are in different countries does not strike me as a good reason. Now, of course, the argument is never put in those terms by the protectionist and mercantilist interest. Rather, they will phrase their objections in what sound like much more plausible terms. They will use phrases that are designed to come across as common sense because they appeal to our intuitions. They appeal to our inner caveman, if you will. So they'll say things like, we can't carry on with a big trade deficit. Or, you know, We have to produce our own food. It only makes sense to feed ourselves. You know, we, we have to protect strategic. You know, I'm all for free trade as long as it's fair trade. Or, or we have to protect our infant industries. All of these things sound like common sense. All of them turn out to be specious. All of them, when translated into policy, serve to make a country needlessly poor. So why do we keep hearing them generation after generation? Precisely because they are intuitive. In the literal sense, they speak to instincts and intuitions buried deep in our DNA. We did not evolve in this world of superabundance and skyscrapers. In our genetic code, we're still roaming the savannas of Pleistocene Africa. We have the instincts of a hunter-gatherer people. We want to have a stash of food nearby. It gives us the reassurance that we're going to be able to make it through the winter. The notion of depending on strangers for stuff that we can't yet see does not come naturally. And yet, if we give in to those caveman intuitions, we always end up being penurious. And I say always advisedly. It was in 1824 that the great Whig historian, poet, uh, and Indian administrator and politician Lord Macaulay said, free trade, one of the greatest benefits that a government can bestow upon a people is in every country unpopular. Right? 1824, think of the extraordinary advances in human prosperity that we've had in those exactly 200 years. And yet there has never been a moment in those 200 years when free trade has been popular. Why? Because, as I say, we are a, we're a tribal species, we're a hunter-gatherer species, and we all tend to begin with our gut intuition and then reason backwards and convince ourselves of something that may not be logical. Now, I don't believe that anyone is born a free trader. It's precisely these gut intuitions that you can, if you like, educate people out of. I certainly did not begin. I'd be surprised if anyone in this room began with some intuitive knowledge of, you know, Ricardian comparative advantage. In fact, I remember the first time when I was an undergraduate that somebody talked me through the David Ricardo thesis. And the first time I heard it, I thought, no, that can't be right. And I kept going back looking for a flaw. How can it possibly be the case that if another country can outcompete you at everything, if they have relative and absolute advantages in everything over you, I can see that free trade is good for them. How can it possibly be good for you? Right? And yet, 
of course, Ricardo shows that it, it must mathematically be the case. By the way, one of the happiest truths in economics, it means you can just sit back on your bum and get richer as long as the other guy's productivity improves. I don't know why we find that such a difficult idea. It's, a, it's, a, it's an incredibly happy fact about the world, but it doesn't come naturally. Paul Samuelson, the Nobel Prize winning economist, famously said, it's the only idea in economics that is both surprising and true. And, and, and so every generation struggles with this. But that is, of course, precisely the function of think tanks like this one and uh, 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 universities like Buckingham. It's to teach people the counterintuitive truths. Those are the things that once you've seen, you can't unsee. And so if only for the sake of, not, not, in, the, not in the belief that it's going to convince a majority, because just as in Macaulay's day, it never will, because people will still go with their hunches. But for the record, let's run through what it is that unrestricted commerce has done. First of all, most obviously, it has made people much richer. It is an incredibly powerful eliminator of poverty. Something like six or 700 people have been lifted out of extreme poverty since I started talking. That's six or 700 arguments for globalization since I began. New arguments, right? Because uh, it, it, the, the falls in poverty, the real uh, increases in living standards over the last 30, 40 years have been precisely in the, particularly those Asian and African countries that have dropped autarky and joined the global market system. There is then, of course, a, a rather overlooked argument, but the original argument for it, which is it makes people get on better. Free trade is an extraordinarily good way of making wars a bit less likely. Now, no one sadly has come up with a way of eliminating war. I wish somebody could, but Man is fallen, and there are always going to be abuses and conflicts. But when you try and correlate rises and falls in, in violence, in armed warfare, with any other factor, democracy or the rule of law, the one that you are closest to is free commerce. For, for, for the reasons that, you know, uh, Cobden and Bright set out when they were campaigning for it, in the 19th century, which is, first of all, free trade removes the need for conflict. If everyone can buy assets on the same terms, if the, if the product is available to everyone, then it ceases to matter whose country it's in. And second, it, it raises the costs of conflict because, uh, as Russia is finding at the moment, once you engage in a war and remove yourself from the global system, you pay a much heavier cost than if you were an autarkic country. So there is a uh, uh, there is a functional reason free trade makes us richer. There is a pacifying reason. It is a remarkably apt tool for poverty alleviation. Uh, sorry, for, for, for conflict resolution. But there is also a straightforward moral case, and that is to do with freedom and free contract. The great thing about free trade is that it cuts out the middle. It means that if you have a good idea, and you have something that the rest of the world wants, nobody comes between you and them and makes it illegal. Now, I come back to that magic pill. All of the arguments on the other side about, oh, what about devastated communities and, you know, we need to support working people and all this, they are all ways of making the pill more expensive. They are all, in other words, a way of privileging a minority, usually a politically connected minority or a minority that has a powerful trade union that is politically connected, at the expense of the general population. When Donald Trump slapped on his sugar tariffs, yes, he was propping up a few uh, growers in, in Florida, but hugely to the cost of all downstream industries in confectionery and food processing. When he had his steel tariffs against China, he was destroying many more jobs in construction, in car making, and indeed making ordinary consumers poorer in order to privilege one particular sectional interest. And so when people say, look, free trade is all very well, but sometimes we, we have to think of the national interest, I would just come back and say, what do you mean by the national interest? If by the national interest you mean the interest of the nation as a whole, then the only way of pursuing it is to take the government's thumb off the scales and allow people to make whatever moral choice they want as a free individual. I repeat, you want to sell me that bill, I want to buy it. You need a very good reason to come between us. And as long as you are encouraged to be selling it to the widest number of people, 
without any considerations of caste or creed or race or nationality, you are having to think yourselves into the minds of your customers. And so trade serves to make us more empathetic, draws us into harmonious, natural, organic networks instead of having to look up to the state for privileges and for special favors. In short, free trade, as well as making us better off, makes us better people. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel.